Welcome to the Trainers Bullpen, where trainers in the law enforcement space come to hear the experts talk about their work, experience, and research into human performance, particularly as it relates to the critical aspects of training, motor learning, and adaptive decision making. The purpose of the Trainers Bullpen is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement training and the findings of academic research and current pedagogical best practice. Our desire at the Trainers Bullpen is to help advance law enforcement training, make research applied, and improve officer and public safety. The Trainers Bullpen is a production of Raptor Protection, and I'm Chris Butler, your host. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Dr. Paula Denota and Chief Inspector Yuha Mati Hutha. Dr. Denota received her PhD in psychology from York University, specializing in brain, behavior, and cognitive sciences. Using multiple neuroimaging imaging techniques and behavioral experiments, Paula's research showed how training and expertise shape brain activity and impact performance. As a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, Paula's current research focuses on the complex relationships between stress, learning, performance, resilience, and health in police. Paula has trained and evaluated frontline tactical and military personnel from across Canada and Europe. Her ongoing collaborations with the Police University College of Finland identify effective educational practices for situational awareness and lethal force decision making. Paula is also a member of CIPSRT, a national research consortium that aims to support wellness and functioning in police and other public safety personnel. Paula's interdisciplinary research is published in top peer-reviewed journals in cognitive psychology, policing, and occupational health, and has been translated into actionable policy recommendations for evidence-based police education. Chief Inspector Yuha Mati Hutha is a doctoral candidate in the Faculty of Education and Culture at Tampere University, Finland. He is a use of force instructor and works as Chief Inspector at the Police University College of Finland. He has been a police officer for 20 years and has experience in special units, including canine and regional special response teams. His primary research interest focuses on understanding and developing situational awareness in policing and for the purpose of improving police training. Well, Dr. Denota and Chief Inspector Hutha, welcome to the Trainers Bullpen and thank you for making the time to join us this morning. Thank you. Well, I should say this. I should say that you're welcome. I should say this evening, uh, out of respect for for you over in Finland joining us uh, this morning, Inspector. So um, we're going to be talking about situational awareness, and I was very interested to read the paper that you both authored. The paper is entitled Deriving Expert Knowledge of Situational Awareness in Policing, a Mixed Methods Study. And this paper was published in the Journal of Police and Criminal Psychology in 2023. And just for our listeners on Spotify or Apple podcast, if you go over to the trainer's bullpen, you'll be able to download a copy of the research paper there. And we strongly encourage you to do that to help you uh, glean as much information as you can out of this podcast. So um, I'll just open it up to uh, either of you, whoever wants to start first, but uh, how did this study come about? I mean, why did you decide to do a research study into situational awareness? Thank you. Well, there's lots of uh, lots of lots of reason for that. Of course, being an, uh, in the fields officer and uh, also uh, user force instructor now, like twenty years. Uh, of course, I have wanted to develop my own skills as well and uh, and the fact is that in police training in Finland and all over the world has traditionally focused on various police tactics and techniques and of course training these and of course that is right there has also been lots of talk about the importance of decision making and it has also been studied but in real reality However, we cannot make informed decisions based on an ongoing situation if we do not understand the ongoing situation. And this understanding is achieved through the skill of forming and maintaining situation awareness. Basically, that, that is the ma- main reason, because seeing even the 
expert officers, even good colleagues of mine, uh, failed in the situation they should have not. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to understand why 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 it is so. Basically, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because, so sorry, you wanted to add something on there. Go ahead. Maybe, maybe because when we have when we are actually situation awareness state, we can base our decisions on that on situation awareness. We can choose appropriate tactics and base base all other action on this genuine understanding uh, what is happening right now and how the situation can develop. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the basis and foundation upon which decision making and the actions should be based on. Right, absolutely. I really like how you said that. You know, one of the things that I've often said for law enforcement officers is the most important skill that we can develop is actually sense making. It's uh, being able to rapidly gain a sense or an understanding of what's occurring around you and the importance of that, because that foundation, as you said, drives everything forward with respect to the decision making and the tactics. Now, uh, in law enforcement, we have for a long time spoken about situational awareness. This word gets thrown around by police trainers. Uh, you know, while well, you need to maintain situational awareness or worse, you lost situational awareness. Uh, but what does that mean? And if you try to pin a trainer down to define situational awareness, you find there's no concise definition of it. We don't really know what it is, and we certainly have would have no idea how to even measure it, whether we have it or we've lost it. So let's start there. Let's start with a working definition of situational awareness. So in your research, in your paper, and, and for our understanding, how do you define situational awareness? Well, uh, well actually, the whole situation awareness is defined in my doctoral thesis, in my dissertation. By the way, I am I'm a doctor of education now. The, the, yeah, the was, bio was out of date. It was a candidate, <laughs> but he's now Dr. Uh, Juha Mati Hufta, so we should up, update that. But yes, congratulations. Outstanding. Yes, congratulations. And we we have we have uh, one one photo of that which may, we may be able to link to this one. But for this uh, for this particular article uh, we define we define the situation awareness uh, the way the experts were gaining that so that was based on how the experts uh, were doing it and uh, it is uh, uh, there was one one episode you with with uh, Joel Susu which was with you, and uh, you talk about this cognitive task analyze, and we kind of did we didn't go that far with this uh, with this uh, uh, study, but we kind of did that kind of uh, interview questions about the situation. So it was basically the way that uh, we ask the expertise, we show them the. 13 static images about uh, police situation, and then we asked the very same two questions. Uh, and we were told them beforehand what those questions would be, so it, uh, it was always the same. So basically it was that uh, two questions. The first one was, Paula, correct, correct me if I don't remember right, uh, uh, what there is uh, what might ha happen next and how can the situation develop? That was the question number one. And question two was, how do you act? Uh, tell me also your all other possibilities to act and justify. Basically that. And that was how we get the seven elements, seven teams, uh, which, which kind of create the situation awareness in police encounters. All right. Now, as I under, 
understand it in in reading your study, and please correct me if I, I'm wrong on this, but you were looking at the differences between novices and expert performers and decision makers, and in in that is in how they analyze what are they seeing in these scenes as as they're presented, and what are they picking up on, and and then you in looking at the differences, like were you able to determine so these themes that you spoke about, uh, is that what evolved out of an analysis of how do novice officers versus expert officers assess these scenes, or, or how how did you undertake that? Uh, with the, with the whole the data, data, of course, it was it was uh, uh, read through several times just to trying to find these themes first. And after that, we started to we started to calculate how many how many teams every participants were able to find. And the seven teams came they came from the experts because of course the rookie officers novices they weren't able to uh, they they weren't able to gain the understanding of the situation using these teams. There were no words or or meaningful senten sentences uh, for these teams. Of course, there were few, and uh, there were two levels of, of rookies, the very uh, low level and uh, those one who were already going to go to their field practice. So they had all or almost all of uh, tactical tactical uh, education uh, so far and there were a few who were able to recognize even the seven there were two guys who were able to recognize seven teams with one picture but uh, in, in one situation but that, that was only this one situation but basically the experts were able to find these seven almost in a, almost in every 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 situation and what was so nice about it that there was there was no eight there was no there was nothing to make us to think that might have been there eight or number nine, but uh, there, there, there wasn't. It was like this uh, this moment when I had this like terrible good vibes all over me that uh, there is actually so so good data and uh, it can it can show so so easily uh, how the experts uh, are gaining the situation awareness. Paula, you can continue. Yeah, yeah. You he had a sort of a eureka moment, it sounds like. But uh, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't involved in that stage of the process. So maybe to explain a bit how I came into the, the picture. So uh, Yuha Mati had kind of concocted this whole question and based on his experience as an instructor and his observations again and trying to get a more concrete definition of essay as as you mentioned chris like there there's no way to really operationalize or, or measure it in in a way that's standard across policing um so uh yohamati developed the the experiment conducted it did the qualitative analysis as you mentioned uh but it was when we met in 2018 i was there uh doing a, a field study and with my background in neuroscience, you mentioned something about an eye tracking study. And I was immediately interested, like, wait a minute, what do you have some kind of like eye, eye tracking data and police, you know, that's very rare. Uh, and so we just continued to collaborate uh, from there. And, and I helped with sort of the uh, like composing of, of the articles, putting it into English, because of course, his dissertation and finish and his explanation would will be perfect. Uh, but to try to bridge that terminology uh, like even just linguistically from, from Finnish to English and trying to find the right words. Uh, my, my maternal Finnish heritage really paid off and, and came, uh, came in handy in this particular collaboration. Um, and so, yeah, so over the last uh, six years or so, we've, we've spent a lot of time over Zoom and phone, uh, just working for, for many hours and having great conversations about these things and, and putting, you know, the several articles together. Uh, but it's just been so eye-opening also just to learn from Yuhamati and his experience. He's shared very generously to me that everything I know about policing, I would have to say, definitely comes comes from him and his operational insights to uh, understanding, you know, well, why why might this be so important? Or, you know, as we're writing, 
you know, a result or discussion section, you know, I'll have questions and almost serve as that external reviewer. And, and he always had, you know, such an A plus answer for it. So, uh, so yeah, so it's come together in, in these works, but just to kind of clarify my, my involvement in it. Excellent. Yeah, it's so valuable to have both the deep operational policing experience and the research background in a team like that coming together. Now, when you, so I understand you showed images to the, to the officers. Can you give us an idea, like what were the images? What was the content of them? And, and what were you hoping that they would identify? Had you already predetermined what important uh, aspects of those images were, or were you just letting those evolve naturally out of what the observers told you. Yeah, we, with those with those uh, two questions, uh, they they just talk whatever they felt like it. Of course, sometimes I need to encourage them to speak even more because they they start to get a little frustrated with with thirteen situations and all starting all over again to talk about it but there was like police encounters like no risk and high high risk like normal normal police task maybe domestic violence task or or whatever so very very basic ones those, those are actually the same you already when uh, when paula was here the first time paula showed so that those were the those were the uh, situation those were the pictures i showed showed to them so as realistic as possible, every one of those, of course, has come in my in my operational lives many times. It has happened in the real world, and uh, uh, I didn't want to put like too many high threat situation because oh, luckily poli policing is not that all the time. But still, we need to be aware. We still, we need to be able to understand what is going on, what might happen next. So the situation awareness should be always there. We we should always be we should we should always be situational aware, just like just like you said. But be, before situation awareness uh, can be taught, it must be understood and it must be defined. And this is this is the studies. These studies are for that. And in my dissertation, I try to be very precise about definition of a, of a SA in these police encounters. And you had mentioned earlier about eye tracking. Now, you, you didn't do eye tracking on this particular study, or, or did you? Did, did the officers have eye trackers as they were observing these images? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so like a combined paradigm, if, if I can jump in. So the first... <clears throat> One article published the the eye tracking findings, so where officers were actually looking, and then the article that we're discussing today relates to the qualitative analysis of the interview question. So after each image was shown and officers' gaze was tracked, then they were asked, "Okay, what what did you see? What would you do? What would you do next?" Um, and the qualitative analysis is how the, the the themes were derived for the definition of SA, and again, in police-specific encounters. So not only critical encounters, not only high threat where, you know, there's a weapon visually present somewhere on the table, but also the more benign, ordinary uh, interactions, but always involving a person. There was always a, a person in, in the scene, not just a landscape. Okay, so that's helpful. I was just reading in your paper here, so you spoke about this. You said in a recent investigation, early stage situational awareness has been operationalized using officers' gaze and fixation patterns. While these objective visual motor behaviors may indicate where an officer is looking, it does not guarantee that the officer will consciously perceive and code and recall what their eyes have seen. And I thought that was very insightful. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, why why do we need to understand that just because we're an eye tracker tells us where the foveal vision has scanned or covered in a scene that may be completely different than what an officer is perceiving and encoding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's basically like in, in every kind of training. Even though we do the right things, but it might be that uh, we do it by by an accident, that it, that we are not actually gaining any uh, any learning, and it's the same. It's, it's the same in in eye tracking stuff. Even though we are able to 
fo- focus our gaze somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that we actually understand. And of course, stress has so like an enormous part of this also. And maybe maybe we can talk about stress a, a, a little bit because it's uh, it's like connected to everything. Uh, but yeah, because in real life situations, we may have only like a few seconds to decide what to do. This decide whether we need to cut the distance between us and the target person and just take him down, or should we should we find more more cover, ballistic cover, or do we need to do we need to uh, save some bystander or a victim? So there are only a matter of a second. So we wanted to find out the case behavior uh, and also that whether we understand what we are seeing. Because if not, we are we are losing time. Right, Paolo, okay. please. Paolo, Paolo, please continue. Uh, I think you you've, you've said it all there, but but it's absolutely true. And uh, and even you know, vision neuroscience research that again I have a background in that that was the part that fascinated me in terms of understanding what is that cognitive connection between eye movements and gaze and fixations. And and not only just the perception of it, but as we know, the you know the traditional definition of situational awareness is perception, understanding, and prediction. So if your eye lands on something, you know presumably you've seen it, you've you've now perceived it, but that might not happen. So then the downstream understanding and prediction is now going off in a completely different direction. So that was sort of my my fascination with this whole line of research, as well as understanding how are each of these discrete cognitive processes connected. And it's not always in a linear way, uh, because again, what you perceive from your vision, we know is informed by your expectations, your prior knowledge, the prior patterns that you have in your mind of, okay, you've gone down this dark alleyway and nine times out of 10, there's a bad guy there. So on, you know, trial number 10, how does that expectation actually influence your, your perception in the moment? Uh, and as Yuha Mati said, then when you introduce stress on top of that and the physiology and how that reorganizes all of these processes in the brain uh, is a totally different situation. So we do have to sort of keep in mind that the, the results of, of our investigations were without stress. Uh, it was just to sort of develop this fundamental understanding of the early stage. So we refer to that as the eye tracking data, that early visual perception. And then through the themes, through that qualitative analysis of answering their questions, that's how we under- get to the understanding piece and the actual perception Like, what did the officers see, regardless of where their eye landed in the eye tracking data, um, you know, will they recall seeing, you know, an, an object on the table or or understanding how certain pieces are connected to each other that that might not occur. And that can only be understood through this sort of tacit knowledge and understanding sort of the internal internal thought processes that uh, are, are hard to probe and, you know, self-report survey questionnaires and ticking a line on a Likert scale that doesn't always get down to it. Uh, so I, I, I have to commend Yuhamati in his early research days and, and being able to design a very elegant study, I think, that tapped into um, very inherent, implicit processes that officers know you embody situational awareness, you know what it is, but to articulate it and to verbalize it is is another another thing entirely. Right. And I mean, I think that's the whole goal of this study, right, is if you can find out what experts are actually doing, then can we codify those skills and actually begin to teach them to law enforcement officers, even early on in their training, right at the academy level, can we begin to give them, as it were, a leg up uh, before they even hit the street? So they're not just learning from the school of hard knocks. Can we give them that game intelligence uh, through this? So I think this is an incredibly important study. Now, uh, Paula, you mentioned briefly, you quickly went through like these three components of perception, comprehension, and projection. So I'm wondering, I mean, those three components seemed to me to be very foundational to what embodies situational awareness. And so maybe can you just spend a minute, um, either of you just expanding on perception, comprehension, and projection? Sure, sure. So I think um, that this derives from Mika Ensley's model of situational awareness. So in the the mid 90s, um, you know, they published uh, these important studies really identifying 
uh, these three stages. And that's sort of been the working definition of situational awareness. But I, I don't believe that that was initially um, derived or defined in a policing context. Like that, that's just situational awareness uh, very broadly. Um, but what, uh, what again, what we've tried to do is try to understand now how, how do those same processes apply or do they, number one? And number two, how does that apply to police specific situations? And again, ranging from the high threat to the, the low threat, uh, you know, interpersonal interactions, it's something that is, is so heavily emphasized in training, but what does that actually mean? Does it follow that same process, which generally per perception precedes understanding, precedes prediction, but not always. When an officer receives a call and maybe it's to a certain neighborhood or an address that they've been to before, you already have a prediction maybe that precedes your understanding and perception before you even arrive. So I think we wanted to move a little bit away from these more linear models and in general, just understanding very concrete, discrete themes that can be then trained, as you said, and giving um, officers earlier on a leg up and deriving that from experts. So now how can we build that expertise earlier if, if we've got that that knowledge and understanding? So we, we definitely tried to not present the themes in any kind of an order, uh, emphasize that they overlap very heavily as well. And you know what, what you perceive in the environment then defines your tactical options and opportunities, things like that. So there are a lot of interdependencies among them, uh, but we've tried to define them as, as discreetly as possible. Okay. And so I just want to ask a question about comprehension, just so that I'm clear and, and I don't want the listeners to be confused because in my experience, experts often comprehend without knowing. And I, you know, Gavin De Becker in The Gift of Fear, he actually used that phrase. He's, he calls it that that tacit, powerful, implicit knowing without knowing. And and uh, Chief Inspector, you said that some of the candidates in the study got frustrated with your questions. And I was thinking, well, I can imagine that because sometimes experts don't know why they know, they just no. So is it hard to get uh, to try to codify that expertise, like trying to get them to articulate what did you actually see and what was it, why was it important? What did it mean to you? Because we're trying, it seems to me we're trying to go from something that's so tacit and almost subconscious and reflexive to bringing it to the cognitive level. You're absolutely right. This is this, this was the main focus all the time. And uh, yeah, it was, and uh, especially especially the guy uh, guys who were not uh, user force instructors because the user force instructors that was quite easy for them because they have kind of uh, learn as a tra trainers they have learned to to languaging their own thinking process already so they it wasn't that hard for them but uh, but the guys who were in K9 on SWAT teams. And were not user force instructor. That was that was definitely hard for them, because it 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 was somewhere they couldn't recognize. And of course, these these teams this this was uh, made up by me. Uh, they may have not not use any of those actual words, but uh, but the meaning of the sentences were the one. When 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 we did this thematical analyze when we were finding and of course there was a good uh, good colleague of mine who used to be who used to be in, in the army and now he has been a police a police officer several years he was the other one who went through this whole whole data and we didn't we we like cross check and do the individual and then cross check many time and and uh, it was an, it was so like nice to find out that. Actually, there is the seven, and there is there is not six, not five, not eight, but seven. And when I talk with these results to the guys who were involved in this study, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe these uh, teams. Did I actually mention those? Yes, you did, but you used different words. Uh, and then they were thinking, but was it really so that we were there, like as an individual, one by one, because? How come we are speaking so alike? That's what uh, expertise is. We in in every profession, I believe, when you are when you get to the ex expert point, uh, we kind of uh, we start to be like quite 
close to each other. Yeah, it 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 was it was amazing, and, and uh, with help with Paula, I was able to uh, share these results just very briefly with the Toronto ETF group, their SWAT team, and show them a few few pictures and ask them to say aloud what they think of this, saying the same two uh, questions, asking the same questions. And they found the exact teams. Mm -hmm. So not, not even the cultural differences make any difference with these teams. Of course, that wasn't a study. It was just, uh, just we just wanted to find out what would yeah. happen. But it was so nice. Yeah, that, and, and they did the same thing. Yeah. The guys for doing for doing that. Yeah, and I, th I thank them because yesterday, I was actually just there yesterday again, I, I've, uh, I've been invited to uh, just speak on some of these things, stress and motor learning and uh, cognition, and and uh, and they're very interested, and, and uh, we did the same thing. I showed a couple of, of the photos and just told them, okay, I'm going to show you you guys a, a photo, and I want you to just say say out loud, you know, what, what do you see? What are some of the elements that you see? Uh, what would you do next? And, uh, you know, and go. And same thing, the things that they were calling out, it relates to the distance and time, relates to, you know, pro profiling the suspect, saying things about the individual or uh, understanding things about the surrounding environment. So as, as Yuhamati said, these are really universal principles that officers anywhere touch upon these same elements. They kind of come across similar encounters, whether the geography is, is then different a lot more snowy pictures in the Canadian and Finnish police uh, samples, maybe compared to you know officers down south somewhere. They're in palm trees and things like that, but it's still a physical environment that needs to be understood and your position relative to other elements within that scene, whether it's people or potentially dangerous objects. Uh, and and that was something that's impressive as well to observe among these like high level elites. And what we found in in the analysis as well is that. While you know the the rookies might say, oh, there's a there's a gun on the table, so that you know that indicates dangerous object that ticks that one theme, but then the elite officers then in in another image where there is no visible weapon anywhere will say, well, there's a kitchen in there. I would go in there to see is there a knife block or is there the potential for the presence of a dangerous object or you know the the officers got it or the person the target person has their fists balled up, so they might be in a position to, you know, assault or something like that. Whereas then the rookies have more of like a, a dispositional analysis, like, oh, he looks angry or he looks aggressive, like some some sort of a conclusion, as opposed to judging like their their physical capacity or, or functional capacity in a way that an, an expert would do. And again, seeing those responses coming from the Canadian SWAT officers and, and in Finland, it, it's really hopeful for us that these are really universal themes. Sure, absolutely. And so let's talk about those themes. So I'm just going to uh, state them here in your out of your paper. So it says the interview data raised seven specific themes that define the elements from which situational awareness is derived in police specific situations. And these are distance time law, partner roles, profiling suspect, surrounding environment and conditions, tactical options and opportunities, ongoing assessment of own tactical activities and outcomes and dangerous objects. So uh, those are the seven. Let's just go through them because in your report, you did a great job of outlining each one of the seven, what it meant and what why they were important as, as themes of situational awareness. So let's start with the first one, distance and time law. What, what does that mean and, and why was that found to be important? Yeah, that is that was actually the easiest one and i really hope that that would uh, come out from the data because this is something we have always tried to emphasize when we have been training user force and police tactics but yeah it's a uh, it is that the experts experts are uh, evaluating the distance and time and it's like uh, going all the way around What's the distance between me and the target person? What is the distance between the target person and the victim? What is the distance between the target person and the kitchen? What is the distance between target person and the, uh, another room where I, I'm not able to see? So, because there might be some dangerous object as well. 
uh, how much how much time it would take for the target person to try to reach some uh, dangerous object how how much time it be, it would be take for him to charge against me with uh, with bare hands and and so on how much time would i have uh to maybe take some non lethal use of force tool uh, and so on so it's like estimating the distance and estimating the time we have in 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 uh, like 160 degrees like all over the place mm -hmm. that was the that was the main thing what the uh, what uh, what the experts said in this uh, in this uh, research and uh, obviously it, it is very understandable mm -hmm. And that's something that we observe also in, in other data that we have and uh, studies that we've done in Canadian police officers and doing use of force scenarios and reviewing the debrief after with an instructor. Um, uh, I've just recently been analyzing some transcripts looking at memory data. So that's something forthcoming to see, like what did the officer actually remember or, or uh, provide during the debrief similar to uh, our paradigm here to try to derive memory and understanding from these uh, debrief interviews. But something that kept coming up with the instructors is saying like, okay, that was good, good use of distance and time. So even in a, in a whole separate context, separate country, separate study, uh, the, those two words always paired together, distance and time is definitely something that is already being uh, emphasized and utilized, but understanding that now as a critical component of situational awareness, that, that that's a, one of the building blocks is now something that we can contextualize a little bit better. Uh, and also, instead of just saying, yep, distance and time was really good, and leaving it at that, there's also hopefully guidance for police instructors in this article in order to say a little bit more about that. Okay, so why is distance and time relevant or important now? Or why did you do that well or not so well? Well, you you provided yourself adequate distance in order to make decisions, or you close that distance maybe a little bit uh, too early and put yourself now in a, in a risky situation and your tactical options then were now narrowed as opposed to, you know, if you had maintained that distance. And we also know that in the stress research, so maybe as we go through the themes, if we can sort of uh, discuss how stress might now influence these things. Um, I know research from Arne Neuenhaus and Bill Lewinsky looking at spatial sense and spatial memory, that when you introduce physiological stress, uh, people, not just police officers, human beings, we tend to underestimate distances. So knowing that as well, knowing what other researchers have, have said uh, and discovered about these processes too is really valuable in the sense that, okay, we know that distance and time is an important thing for SA, but also when you're in a stressful situation, you really need to focus on that and understand you might have a tendency to underestimate it. So even just being mindful of that is now a, a, an advantage that officers can potentially have in training so they don't find themselves in situations where they are underestimating it and potentially putting themselves or others in, in more of a vulnerable situation. Right. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And it seems to me this distance and, and time law, Chief Inspector, as, as you've uh, said, we've spoken about this in law enforcement forever, the importance of distance and time relationship. And so it, it seems to me it would be important then two things arise out of that in my mind is making sure that officers are exposed to all of the research and training, like you said, Paula, around, you know, how fast people can move, the sprint studies, uh, how long it takes officers to be able to move, how can I actually move and get off the X? What does my movement look like? Can I access a conducted energy weapon, for example, a taser as I'm thinking about this? Do I have time to be able to do that? So making sure that they're aware of that, but then also putting them in drills or micro simulations so they can practically experience what do do those distance and time relationships look like it would seem to me to be an important impl implication out of this one one theme would you would you agree disagree would you add on to that absolutely that that, that is exactly the, the thing and even though we have we have used the term distance in training but it still might have been that we haven't been uh, enough precise with it. So uh, it might be that some officers have learned and understood uh, the distance like wrong way in the first hands. And, and after working years, 
officers may have had like many encounter with target person, of course, and also many of those when target person have had a knife or an axe, something like that. And most of the time, uh, maybe every time, luckily, the end result of these tasks have been good. And that is actually dangerous because then we don't understand that there was that uh, very serious risk involved if nothing bad is happening, even though we are not taking the time, we are not taking the distance, even though we would have the opportunity and we definitely should. So uh, then, then it comes to the next team, uh, not, not the next one in, in, in a row, but like the target persons, functional capacity. So it m might be that uh, maybe the target person have not been at the same time motivated to hurt us or motivated to hurt some el someone else and the target person's functional capacity has not been good so because of alcohol or some paralyzing drugs or medication and even with the, even with an axe or knife in his or her hand and then we got the expression that okay we have had this task we know what we are doing and actually it wasn't measured because the target person's functional capacity was so poor it actually didn't tell anything about our own action, our own tactical thinking, our own situation awareness. So that's the reason we need to talk about even 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 like like you said, like you said, this is like this has been here forever. Distance has been there forever, but we definitely need to do it, and we need to practice. Just like you said, we need to we need to definitely practice uh, uh, and understand how long it takes. To, to pick up the taser or give up the gun on the holster if there is no lawful right for, for gun anymore, or how long it to takes for us to cut the distance uh, of, of five meters and whether we can do it before the target person can take the knife from the table, which might be like two meters away from him. So this is something we just definitely need to practice. We need to know our own functional capacity and try to, try to see and predict uh, and by profiling the suspect, the target person's functional capacity as well. Perfect. Great. So, and then the next theme in your list, and I don't think these are in order of, of importance, but the next theme that you listed was called partner roles, partner height slash roles. So what, uh, what, what was meant by that partner roles? Yeah, uh, basically it was because in Finland, we usually, we are patrolling like, uh, with, with partner we are always two in the in the in the police car and we are, we are get used to it we have been get used to that so everything what we do is based on that we have like four eyes and uh, and four 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 hands so so that was uh, how they estimated the situation all the time what i'm doing where i might take the leading leading role and uh if I know that my partner is not able to see that corner over there, I just talk that aloud without taking my focus on that. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you if you, you would be there beside me. I wouldn't tell you. Okay, Chris, there's a dark corner. I cannot see because, of course, I lose my focus on the high threats already. So uh, it was like common understanding what is going on and. Because of there are two of us, it's easier to gain the situation awareness because we can see more, we can hear more, we can feel more, and kind of that's something we need to share. Paula, do you want to add something with, with better English? Your English is just fine. It's a okay, and I don't know that mine is any better, anyways. But um, yeah, so the. Just to expand on that a little bit too, is this idea of a collective situational awareness, which when talking about partners or tactical teams that sometimes, you know, they're operating in groups of four or six, uh, you know, having observed them moving through a, a scenario space, it's, it's amazing. It's almost elegant to see them moving almost as one, separate bodies and separate minds moving as one, but, um, but it's emerged as, as a distinct theme in the sense that once again, expert officers have this shared uh, collective uh, essay experience where there, there's an implicit understanding of like, okay, if 
so-and-so is doing this, then that redefines my role and my options and my actions. What, what might I be responsible for? Or if so-and-so is doing X, Y, Z, so it shows that they're already showing an awareness of this X, Y, Z, whatever is happening in the situation, but the, um, the ability to sort of prioritize, well, I'm not going to also explore X, Y, Z, but I'm going to do something else. So that shows like uh, top high performance, efficiency, expertise at, at the highest level. Um, so revealing that and again, presenting it as part of this, uh, the group of, of seven themes that we have, hopefully we can train uh, train the, the rookies to, to develop that earlier as well so that there isn't redundancy, there isn't overlap or there aren't, there aren't missing elements in a situation because two partners haven't communicated well or are kind of doing the same thing. Uh, so this seems like a very critical communication piece as well. Exactly. And so these partner roles then, is it would it be fair to say really at the core of that is the importance of attentional awareness. So if I'm working with my partner, uh, I know I need to know two things. I need to know where am I attending and why is it important that I attend there? But also at the same time, I need to know I'm not attending to other areas of the scene. And so my partner's attentional focus needs to be on those. And in law enforcement, we've referred to that as contact and cover type principles for a long time but really what we're talking about is is intelligently split attentional processes to develop one situational awareness between both officers that are there and and I think that's important because we need to make sure our training because we so often will have a single officers riding in single cars here in North America lone uh, officers but then they show up at a call where now all of a sudden there's two officers or maybe three or more officers, and we often see a failure of communication, a failure of teamwork, and you've got two or three or more independent officers there, but they're not functioning together mm -hmm. as a team. So I think this partner role theme that came out is critically important. And again, there's training solutions for that, isn't there? there there's ways that we can train officers uh, to be able to develop that those partner intelligent situational awareness. Exactly, you're absolutely right. You are so you are so right, and and of course, yeah, there are uh, e even even easy training solutions how how we can gain more and uh, more understanding and and uh, better better performance when there is more than more than one or two or three. And that basically with the with all the special teams like SWAT teams, because when they are training, they are training it just like Power said. It's like several people, but like uh, actually like one uh, creature. So, but uh, of course, we we may not have the time in normal police work to train so-called normal officers so much. So. Uh, that's why we need, we need to definitely focus what we are what we are teaching when we have the time. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the third theme. So it was profiling the suspect. Profiling the suspect. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, we we a little bit addressed that already. But uh, if we if we want to share that uh, divide, like what uh, novices said compared to expert it was like just like paula told that uh novices were maybe just the target person's mood is he looking angry or or aggressive but uh experts kind of of course they showed that too they may not be able to say that aloud but they they were saying aloud uh, the functional capacity of the target person uh for example that uh, if the stand was looking if he, he looked like a stand good uh, boxing position, experts were saying that, okay, it he might be that he actually knows how to use his hands. He, he, he might be a martial artist or he might be a boxer. And it's, if some target person had, has so heavy shoes, uh, officers told that, okay, now we definitely need to be aware of the kicks because those shoes are so heavy. We don't want to, we don't want to be to him to kick, kick our face or our knees. So it was uh, that was basically the difference between the novices and experts. Novices uh, were estimating the mood of the target person, and the experts were estimating the 
functional capacity, which of course has a tight correlation with the distance and time also. How fast, how strong the ta target person is able to move makes a uh, whole lot of dif uh, lots of differences about the distance and time we think we have. Mm -hmm. And something else that uh, that was revealed as well among among the experts that were able to piece and, and connect things together was also uh, informing your your profile of the target person by considering the surrounding environment. So I think it was uh, it was nice to to read one of the quotes like in the uh, qualitative analysis. You know, you often have like exemplary quotes of what what the participant will have said, and uh, Yuhamati had chosen one from. Uh, from an officer had said that, well, the, the house, uh, you know, it was an individual standing in front of a house and said, well, the outside appearance of, of the house looks quite tidy. So they, they don't look like a typical police customer. And it was just funny that they had used that, that word customer, but in, in sort of like the colloquial, like tongue in cheek way of saying like someone that we typically encounter, uh, whose, you know, home might be more unkept or, uh, more disheveled. And I'm, I'm sure as, as an operator, uh, Yohamati has a good understanding of this as well and shared shared with me many times that, um, you know, walking into a home that, you know, might might smell really bad or or looks like it's really unkept. Well, that tells you something about that individual that you're potentially going to interact with or the opposite, someone that uh, has a home that's like very meticulous, like completely spotless and everything in particular order uh, I think in one of your past experiences, you, you had said that that person was maybe like a sociopath or like, you know, dangerous, you would you would have, uh, you know, had sort of like your threat level or risk level higher a little bit because that's sort of abnormal or shows like a, a you know, very specific way of, of thinking pieced together with other information. So again, as, as just a civilian, as someone with, without that insight, I, I found it really amazing to understand how it can be on opposite ends of the spectrum, that it's not always, you know, indicative of high threat, but the information can just, just, again, just form a better idea of who are you dealing with? What kind of situation are you walking into? And it's not just based on the physical appearance of that individual, but more the surround as well. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, uh, there was this one, that that one, I, I, I have not do when I have been in the field. I have not uh, been able to profile the suspect based on the watch he, he has, but uh, there was a few guys who actually, because there was this, this one target person's person in the in the study, he had a watch and they knew, these participants, these expert officers knew that, okay, that is the watch that uh, is very uh, uh, typical uh, with martial artists, with the with, uh, with, uh, MMA fighters. So that was kind of, okay, now we need to be very careful with this one. He might be now actually about uh, MMA. Right, right. So let, let's move on to the next one. You spoke about the environment. And so experts in developing their situational awareness, they, this theme of surrounding environment and conditions came through. So what did you, what did you observe with that? You mean the surrounding environment and conditions? Yes. Yeah. That was basically that. Uh, uh, what they talk about these situations, what they said aloud, how they languishing, what they see and what they don't see. So, kind of, the experts always notice noticing. Okay, I'm able to, I'm able to see this much of this space, but there's a dark corner, which I'm not able to see. So. And of course, that actually, actually, of course, that has like uh, this uh, connection to tactical options and opportunities also. So they were able to, by by have good per perceptions of the of the environment, they were able to understand what they know and what they don't know. And uh, I believe you have always used this same same plus one rule what what we have used so it's basically one of those that okay there's a one I, I i'm able to see one target person but there's a dark corner they might be plus one and they might be plus one over there so this plus one plus one rule is very important of course it's connected with the surrounding and surrounding and condi conditions 
Okay. And were the experts in assessing that environment, were they also very aware of uh, their access and egress? So if they needed, like, were they are thinking ahead that if they needed to quickly get out of there, were they aware of where their, where their exit routes and egress were? Were they aware of where cover was and concealment if they needed to reposition uh, compared to novices? Or, or what did you see there? Yeah, definitely. And especially, especially again, the use of force instructors who, who have been familiar with this language in their own thinking. So they were able to they were able to say that a lot, a lot time, many, many times. And of course, that has always been one of the basic basic rules for us. Uh, be aware where you are walking because you might need to come fast with the same route. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And this was something that novices were not as they were not as aware of, or uh, no, there was a... not, not even the one who were supposed to go onto field. So, not even the number number two novices who gain almost or, or almost everything in tactical and use force training. So that that's basically something we need to we need to make better in 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 the police academy definitely. Absolutely. Thank you. And so now number five, tactical options and opportunities. What about this theme? Yeah, basically the officers were, the participants were, were say, say, saying aloud or what kind of tactics are useful, what, uh, how, how many of those are, which they may want to select and which definitely won't be working. And, and, uh, Sometimes the experts went so detailed level that they actually named, for example, physical use of force techniques, technique as a what is what is named in, in Finland. So like, like in, in this particular situation, there's a room, a little space between the target person and the wall. So I definitely use this technique to throw him down that way because uh, there's a pens or table on the right so i'm not able to use this technique uh yeah but uh basically how many opportunities they have how, how many tacticals their tactical uh, possibilities they are and what they might want to choose in this situation excellent and and those tactical options and opportunities then as you said they were actually uh, not only predicting what type of tactic they might use, but also the manner in which it may be effective as the situation was presented and, and which ones may be precluded. Like maybe, for example, uh, in a particular situation, because of the type of clothing an individual is wearing or because of the distance, they may say a conducted energy weapon or a taser is not an option for me at this point because of this and this and this. So were you seeing a lot of like very thoughtful analysis with the experts with respect to not only what they could choose but what they precluded and the reasons why those wouldn't be an option yeah and basically that uh, that gave us the second the next team about this ongoing assessment of own tactical activities and outcomes and uh, the experts were very good at this uh, definitely and and mostly the uh, instructors use of force trainers they were able to language in all of these and and not only about the tactics, but also okay, if if I'm now shouting, okay, police is here, what might happen? So I don't want him to know that police is here right now. So I'm not saying it at this point. I'm not saying anything. I I proceed first, and then I'm I go that that corner, and then I'm going to tell okay, police is here. So like they were able to assess. All they do, their their like activity and and also passivity. Okay, if I don't do anything, this might happen. So they were they were good at they were good at us. And of course, the novices were not able to. Uh, other than this, uh, two uh, novices group from the group two who were almost had everything everything there is to there is to have. In in one particular situation, they were able to use these teams, but uh, but uh, on, only two participants and both of them only once. Mm -hmm. So that's something we definitely need to 
we need to focus on while we are training. They definitely we need to teach them more to predict what happened if I do this, what happened if I don't do anything, and and so on. Paula, please. <laughs> Sounds like you're calling a, a lifeline, but that's yeah. Uh... I, you you moved and uh, I saw your face. On the screen. Okay, no, I'm just I'm nodding in agreement a lot because it's uh, it's it's also from a motor learning perspective then uh, and understanding so how how does one's brain sort of form this network of of understanding okay you know of the themes that we've already discussed like and that's why we really emphasize that they're, they're so interlinked so the the concept of distance and time and uh, and then just trying to think of of training solutions for this of course we're working under you know, very finite time and resources and, and limitations. But in an ideal world, if, you know, we could develop perfect uh, uh, police training and situational awareness and tactics all together, you know, I'm just imagining that you would have an officer in, in the same space, but at various different positions. Now position a target person at different locations. And I think it it just takes a sense of embodiment. Like you need to physically embody and live through these kind of experiences in order to develop this understanding, uh, very implicit tacit knowledge of the relationships between distance and time, your own tactical options, ongoing assessment. Okay, now that I've moved you know, a, a couple of feet, now my surrounding environment has changed, the distance and time, all of these relationships have constantly changed. So really having an embodied understanding of that only comes through physical practice, I think. And I, I think that also explains some of the differences that we see in the novices and the experts. So the early novices with no, no use of force, no tactical training block, these are skills that I would say are impossible for them to understand. Even just being told in a lecture and shown these PowerPoint slides with these themes, they still don't have a fundamental understanding and embodied understanding of what these relationships are like. Then the you know intermediate novices that have had their use of force and tactical training, okay, maybe now they've had a few exposures and simulations and whether they're live or virtual simulations, again, might make a big difference because in, in a, a virtual environment, it's not exactly 3D. You don't exactly get those same distance estimation skills um, that you wouldn't in a live uh, context. And then you have the experts that have years and years of operational experience. You're in the field, you're in different environments and have different exposures and things like that. So um, I, I think it was a really nice uh, aspect of the study to include these different groups, despite the fact that, again, the experts are the ones that really revealed the the, the tacit knowledge and, and the uh, instructors, again, that are able to verbalize these things. It was so valuable to have them be able to do that so that we can identify these themes, but still see where the novices are able to pick up. And it's especially these last ones of this, um, like I like to think of them sort of of these like embodied um, themes of situational awareness where you you have to know your position sense within your body within a space that uh it only comes through that physical practice and exposure right right absolutely and so i want to get into the implications in just a minute uh because i think there's some incredibly important implications for law enforcement training from this study but the, the last theme that came through was dangerous objects so uh just quickly what what can you tell us i think that's pretty self-explanatory the experts picked up on the salient and relevant dangerous objects but it, what what can you add on to that yeah um, yep. just if oh, i can okay. if i may sure. if i yeah, may because yeah. this one is again the was so obvious to me and as you said Chris is su such a salient one uh but it's not only about like the you know detecting the the gun that's on the table uh but the ability to infer the plus one rule again which is something that I learned through all this work with Yule what the plus one rule is uh that where there's one there might be another or if there isn't one in the scene uh you know in, in a kitchen might there be a, a potentially dangerous object there or uh, objects in a scene that again seem benign, like maybe a, a chair or uh, you know a heavy heavy looking object. Well, that can be thrown. Uh, that can be used as a projectile. So it's this ability to infer and predict. So going back to Ensley's models, is having that high level ability to uh, project or predict uh, how an object could be dangerous. So it's not necessarily only you know detecting weapons and things like that. Perfect. Chief Inspector, anything you would add on to that with respect to the weapons? No, 
that that that's what that's that's got it all right so here's what's important and this is why the trainer's bullpen exists it's to actually change law enforcement training to help us advance our practices when i read through your paper i highlighted to to me what stood out were eight implications that could be immediately applied by law enforcement trainers from this study. Now, we don't have time. We've only got about five minutes left. So, but I will encourage the listeners to go through the study and in the back and the last few pages of the study is the practical implications for police training and evaluation of situational awareness. There's critically important, very concrete things that we can be doing but um and chief inspector i'm gonna i'm gonna start with you i want you to imagine that you've got uh five minutes of the ear of law enforcement trainers uh what would you want them to know are the important implications if you said no today you can start making changes to improve situational awareness in in your officers what would you have them do okay Let's start with educational definition about uh, uh, learning phases. One, one is very, very uh, common way is to divide skill learning into three different phases. Cognitive learning phase in which the skill is conceptualized, understood and represented uh, as, as a whole, like gaining the understanding what I'm what I'm learning and why. Then, then it comes to associ associative learning phase. Uh, where we need to start doing that. And of course, the automatic phase comes when we have practice enough. But what we need to uh, concentrate on, what we need to emphasize as instructors, is that this cognitive learning phase. Because uh, we usually we don't have the luxury of time, which is need to re re uh, re reach the automatic uh, phase or even asso associative phase. So we need to focus on cognitive learning phase. So the ones we are training, they have everything they need to train that on their own and doing it right. Because we definitely don't want them to, that they are training any skill which are wrong. So that that basically the thing. And when we are, when we are teaching these seven specific themes about situational awareness and actually Every time we are teaching, we we cannot teach the old-fashioned way, and and the old-fashioned way I I mean the way that we used to do that. Uh, okay, now Chris, it's your turn. There's a room. Go there, and are you ready? And start. And then you just went there. As a trainer, I only watch. I I I only focus on seeing all the mistakes you might have done, uh, and. Uh, not helping you at the time just making like throwing you to the wolves and not helping you at all and then when the training is over then i started to give you feedback and of course you won't be able to uh, have that uh, feedback because you might not be able to remember what what did you see where you where you actually were at that time and so on so and also that also also focuses on us, us to concentrate on the very last decision, like like the outcome of the training, which usually should or no should. Uh, but there is so much between what you have done. So in, in this old fashioned way, training leads to the, the fact that uh, during the performance, uh, we are also as an instructor, I kind of give you opportunity to do a lot of wrong things, wrong motor move, movement movements, absolutely wrong in the present of the situation. So the participants are not situation aware, meaning that they don't know what is going on and they are not able to predict what might happen next. They are just doing something. And of course, there's lots of training scars because of this kind of training. And the learning goals, we can throw them away because we are not gaining those. So we need to pause the training. For these seven teams, we need to we need to teach this. We can do it in the classroom. We need to say, go this through just, just like we did now. Uh, these seven teams, what they actually meaning? What can we do about them? Uh, what we need to focus, focus on? And 
with the understanding of why these seven teams are important, then we then we actually know the cues we, cues we need to find out and we need to analyze, even though we might be this quick as the experts were. Uh, like immediately understanding what is going on, what might happen next. But uh, we need to go this like, it is the same time law, one by one. And then we need to train that. We need to train just like you said, just like you told a little earlier, that we definitely need to train how how long it it takes for me to cut the distance and, and how much how much time it takes for me to walk backwards and so on. So we need to get familiar, uh, familiar with, with those and we need to do that with every different uh, team. And then we then we know this team, then we can start to focus with like maybe a little bigger, like like whole task, lo- whole uh, whole simulator situation. But but and again, we still need to pause the uh, training. For example, uh, we do the little pauses. So, and those are not for giving the actual feedback, uh, but guiding the trainee through the task, asking questions like, okay, Chris, you are standing here. Is this optimal place for you to be? Or is there another even better place to be? And then you focus is what you see, and you might say, okay, well, actually, uh, over here is a little better place. Okay, take a one good big, big breath and continue and reposition yourself there. So we are teaching them to act based on decision, which are based on situation awareness. So it should be this way around. That, that 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 is the thing. If if we if we teach different tactics, we don't know whether they choose the proper one, the, the right one in this situation, because they are not able to understand the situation. So we need to learn. It's the it's the ground rule that the understanding of the situation must come first, and then we can apply all kinds of techniques and tactics and whatever, because we make decisions based on the understanding, based on the real SA. Mm-hmm. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> that that was that was excellent and some great advice. I love how you spoke about the importance of pausing, pausing drills, pausing scenarios, and trying to get inside as a trainer, trying to ask those questions to get inside the head. Dr. Joel Suss is, is heavily uh, a supporter of that, about getting them to think about their own thinking, this idea of metacognition. What are you seeing? Why is it important? What does it mean to you? Um, and and the only way we can help guide them to that self-understanding or self-reflection is through pausing and asking our students those questions. So uh, great advice. Uh, Dr. Genota, I'll give you the last word. What, what, what would you like to see as far as the implications of this for law enforcement training? Um, I I would echo a lot of what Yuhamati said. So in terms of the practical, you know, run through of, of scenario based training, it doesn't require a revolutionary change to what's already being done. I think, you know, uh, there, there might be a lot of resistance to implementing change when, um, you know, there isn't an understanding that we're, we're not trying to make a big, huge uh, global change to anything, but just small, small techniques that that come from pedagogical experts like like you, Hamat, the educators uh, that understand how just very small uh, changes to ongoing training processes, like pausing, like essentially doing like our mini study within the scenario itself, like pausing and asking, okay, what do you see and what what would you do next? Asking those same questions. Now you're tapping into the mindset of of the individual and. Um, also integrating this idea of like stress stress management again. So Yuhamati said, okay, now take a breath and keep going. So you can almost layer on the uh, the lessons there. You're teaching tactics. You're teaching use of force. You're teaching best practices. You're teaching motor skills. But now you're also teaching situational awareness in a very concrete way, drawing their attention maybe to themes or elements that they they have missed maybe uh, to reinforce that. Whereas, you know, some officers might have a very good sense of their own opportunities and ongoing assessment, but maybe they're missing other environmental factors. So now you can tailor that training as well to the individual uh, so that um, so that it, it maximizes the benefit across the board and isn't just like a one size fits all. 
Excellent advice. Thank you, Dr. Denota. Well, we've come to the end of our interview today. It's been a very informative and informational uh, interview. Uh, we've been looking at the study that was uh, published in the journal, International Journal of Police and Criminal Psychology, called Deriving Expert Knowledge of Situational Awareness in Policing. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Paula Denota and Chief Inspector and Dr. Yuha Marihuda for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to having you again on the Trainer's Bullpen to talk about your excellent research. Thank you, Chris. It, it was so nice being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely.